in the events of our times. I'll be putting my questions to tonight's special guests. Good evening. Two innocent British people. For year after year, they languished, locked up, mistreated in one of the world's most notorious prisons. But their spirit was unbroken, and now at last they're free. Last week, Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe and Anoushe Ashouri, seized as prisoners in Iran, returned home. It was the sight their families longed for. But after the euphoria of release come the questions, why were they taken? Why for so long? Why did it take five foreign secretaries before they were freed? Tonight, in his only TV interview, I talked to Anusha Ashouri. Now back at home with his family, this retired civil engineer tells me of the place he called the Valley of Hell. Also tonight, with first a pandemic, then a major war, it looks like economic turbulence is here to stay. If you've noticed your household bills going up, there's some bad news. It's going to get worse. So what a time to be Chancellor of the Exchequer. Not long ago, Rishi Sunak opened up the public pass to furlough millions during the COVID crisis. But now he says he can't insulate us from the coming storm. I'll ask him why not, and whether he really feels affinity with those who suffer the most. Five years ago, Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe and Anoushe Ashouri were ordinary members of the public, British people of Iranian background. They were plucked from obscurity by a terrible injustice, arrested in Tehran and imprisoned by the Iranian government in the notorious Evan prison. Last week, after years of campaigning by their families, they finally returned home. The cause of their release, a deal involving the UK paying Iran a historical debt of £400 million. Still, another man is in a similar predicament called Morad Tabez, who remains in jail. I went to see Anushe Ashouri at his home in the suburbs of South London. Amidst his joy of coming home, I found a man tormented by separation from those he left behind and full of questions for those he feels let him and his family down. Tell, Tell me about, about this. this. Well, we, we attended, attended the market, market class, class yeah. and uh, I, did I did a few, a few pieces. pieces. Uh, this one is what I dedicated to Sherry. What I wanted to start with when we talk about your story is those beautiful pictures that we all saw uh, of you arriving home and being reunited with your family, with Sherry and your two children. How did that moment feel for you stepping off that plane back onto British soil and then seeing your family again? When I think about it now, I, it's still for me difficult to grasp all of that because there were many times that I dreamt about Sherry, about my kids, and I used to wake up to the ceiling of my coffin, we used to call, because the ceiling was about, about half a meter above our heads. So, even waking up uh, to a ceiling which was about a few meters away, away, away from you, it was unbelievable. Mm. And there were times that I used to dream and I used to wake up to that, and it is such an anticlimax, then you wake up to your cell. Mm. Sometimes in my dreams, I used to test myself. I used to pinch myself to feel the pain mm. so that to, to make sure that this is not a dream. Yeah. So you, so it, it's still hard to finally realise that this is now your reality, even, I guess. Even, even last even night, now, even last night, even I, was, last I night. was touching Sherry's hands. Yeah. <laughs> touching <laughs> to her. To make just... sure that, yes, this is, this is re reality, this is happening. We became serious when she was 17. Yeah. We were boyfriends and girlfriends, and we are still boyfriends and girlfriends. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's a long time. Yeah, without, I mean, disregarding whatever we have written and signed. Yeah. We are, That's 50 years, isn't she it? She is my best friend in life. When did you actually believe that you were coming home? What was the moment that you thought, this is actually happening, I'm, I'm going home? It was touch and go up until the last moment. And why was uh, that? Because the Iranian uh, authorities uh, were reluctant, uh, although they had, they had uh, 
told me that I was going to, to be released. Mm. But you cannot exactly be sure. And I'm really grateful to Stephanie Alcock. She did a great job. Uh, up until the last moment, she made sure that uh, we were, she, she was accompanying us mm. to the aircraft. Mm. Uh, and when we took off, I mean, she, she did her job fantastic. So, so do you mean you didn't, even when you were at the airport, you were thinking it was only when the, what, the wheels went up? Yes. And you were in the air that you thought this is real? Even then, I was looking through the window to see if we were being accompanied by any other aircraft. And uh, when we actually left the Iranian airspace, then I was sure that uh, there was no point of return. Going back to, to August the 13th, 2017, yes. when you were arrested, tell, tell me about why you were in Iran, what you were doing that day, and, th and then what happened? Well, uh, my mum lives in Iran, mm. and she's nearly 90 years old. And she had knee problems, and she, uh, we arranged and we had a surgery mm. for a knee replacement. So one day when I was going to the local market to have my suitcase uh, repaired, its zip uh, didn't, uh, didn't work properly. Mm. Uh, as I went down the road in our street, uh, suddenly a car pulled over, and four men, I think it was four, they, they jumped out and said, are you Mr. Shuri? And I said, yes and said, one of them took the suitcase from me and the other one said, can you please sit in the back? And uh, I sat in the back seat, two sat on my sides and, and the two others uh, sat, sat in the front and uh, they started driving. And I was wondering, am I being kidnapped or what is it about? So you... Uh, so as we got into the motorway, uh, one of them gave me a piece of paper, showed it to me, said, read it and it was written on something like anti-espionage uh, right. uh, uh, decree that uh, it was a court order that I should be arrested and be taken to uh, a detention centre. Then uh, they, they, they told me to put on a, a blindfold uh, on, my, my, on my eyes and then I had to they told me to lie on, uh, put my head on the laps of the person who was sitting next to me so that I could hear the traffic and I could hear, uh, feel the bumps and mm. everything. But you cannot, you, you become uh, disorientated when you're yes. lying uh, on your side on somebody's lap. We went into this, into this house. I could, from the bottom of my blindfold, I could see uh, very nice carpets. And they took me into a room, and I sat there, and my interrogator came, and he... You still yeah, blindfolded. They, and uh, it started from there. And when I was taken to 209, I was taken to a room, to a cell. And I was left there. The cell had uh, lights, strong lights, uh, that never went off. There was the sound of this uh, almost malfunctioning air conditioning system that uh, was continuously going like that. And uh, I think a couple of days I was there without anybody seeing me. And I didn't know what is going on mm. until my first interrogation. I mean, were you thinking this is a misunderstanding? I haven't done anything. They don't believe you. And I didn't know then the reason why I was there. Yeah. Only long after that, we, we, we realized when I was in prison, then when I realised that this, is re this relates to a debt that uh, Britain had to pay to Iran. You couldn't speak to anyone? You had to Nobody came to me. They, were. Ju they were just uh, uh, giving the food through these little holes uh, and nobody was talking to me. And what, when you say that they interrogated you, what, would, what did they do? They, they sat you in a room and insisted that you write I'd rather, things down of things I'd you had I'd rather hadn't... not elaborate on that okay. uh, now. OK. Uh, we shall leave that for later. Sure. And, OK, let's talk about Evan Prison. You wrote something in The Guardian that I read very carefully. Um, you, you, it's a, a prison that housed intellectuals and political prisoners. And you said in this article, I live in Evan Prison, Tehran, in the Valley of Hell. 
is that was is that how it was? Was it was it as yes, if you were exactly. living in hell? Literally, that was the valley of hell. And because you, apart in addition to your own suffering, you see the suffering of all the people who are around you. Each of them in their in their own different way. Yeah. Marriages are breaking up. Uh, families are disintegrating. And I was reasoning with myself that if I, when I know that I am innocent and I am here, so everybody else can be innocent mm -hmm. and be there. That must be very hard uh, to live with, knowing that the injustice, the injustice of uh, being imprisoned for no reason, was that hard to, to was that hard to live with? Especially because uh, if you look at uh, the 68 years of my life, you will not see a single sign that I was, yeah. I was uh, having any political uh, leniencies towards any faction. I mean, I was mainly into cosmology, I was in mainly to, into engineering, uh, physics, things that I loved. Mm -hmm. And the innovation that I made in Iran uh, was a certain uh, type of concrete formwork that I managed to get a gold award for that. The account I read was actually really hard to read. I think it must have been unimaginable to live it. Um, you wrote about food so foul that only the most needy yes. prisoners would eat it. You talked about the unbearable stench from the open sewers. You talked about the windowless room, the bed bugs, the cockroaches, yes. the rats, the feces floating yes. along this yes. open yes. sewer. What was the worst thing, or is that just impossible to say, because it was all just so awful? The worst thing, these are, these are the physical things that you, you see, mm. um, but the suffering of the people the suffering. who are there. Uh, a few of them ended up in mental hospital. You... Uh, I mean, these are the, the, the more pronounced effects. You said, um, again, your testimony about fellow prisoners, you said that you could name at least half a dozen who'd attempted suicide, at least two who'd succeeded. I have their names with me, but I cannot reveal them, but, yeah. You it's, said it's, there it's... were a dozen taken to a mental hospital, some had suffered permanent damage due to electrical shock treatment. Yes. You said two dozen had developed severe post-arrest medical conditions, and you said at least two captives were killed on their interrogations. Or to have, been, uh, to have said that they were there, they committed suicide. One of them was Kavu Samami. Uh, the environmentalists, I mean, uh, such fine people, such nice people. Murat Tabaz, who, I mean, uh, he should be here with us. He, he needs medical attention and he's not getting it. I, I, I mean, we cannot celebrate anything without them being here. I am feeling so, so bitter that he was not on the same plane with us. And I'm not going to be quiet until he is back and until the rest of the uh, dual nationals are released. I feel that I have left such fine people. You, you've written about, you did attempt Yes, suicide. Yes, that was when I was in the interrogation centre. And uh, uh, I made a few attempts. Uh, one of them, the scars are on my wrist, uh, when I wanted to cut my wrist. Oh, These are the, well, after four years, they are improving a little bit, but... Uh, and they barged in and they, they uh, undressed me and they took everything away. Uh, that, did, that wasn't successful, so... I remembered the books that I used to see, for example, uh, the people who were starving uh, in Auschwitz. So I thought perhaps if I make a passive uh, hunger strike, because you usually may, uh, uh, you do a hunger strike to protest against something. Because of the threats, which I'm not going to delve into, so I decided not to be. And. Uh, I remember they were giving eggs, boiled eggs, for, that, for breakfast that morning, and I stopped eating. For four days, I did not even drink water 
then I thought perhaps my blood would thicken, and if I have a stroke, then uh, I'll be handed over to... you didn't drink water? I didn't want to be, so I didn't want to drink water, I didn't want to drink any, uh, to eat anything. You lost 17 and kilograms yes, in 17 yes, days. Yes, and uh, that is when my interrogator called me and he said, we are going to show some kindness and we are going to send you to a suite. And that suite is a cell of the same size, but with uh, three other people in it. I cried and I insisted because I was going to, I was telling myself that uh, within the next month, job is accomplished, my mission is accomplished. Uh, and I started crying and insisting that I don't want to be with people, I want to be in the cell. Of course they had mm -hmm. discovered that I, had, I was not eating. So they moved me to that cell and the people in that cell, they didn't succeed in uh, persuading me to eat that evening, but from the next day, uh, I stopped my hunger strike. There were some moments of hope, companionship, resilience that you've shown in spades, but you, you wrote powerfully about the University of Evin and prisoners given, given each other's lessons. I mean, was that something that, that sustained you, that helped you this... What, what, tell, tell us about the, the, the university. Well, you could see uh, talented people around you. This person is uh, a specialist, he has got a PhD in quantum physics. The other one has got a PhD, who was a pr university professor. Up until uh, the moment of his arrest, he was busy lecturing at the university, teaching economics, or similar cases like that. So you would actually get to know these people and you would offer if they could uh, teach you a little bit of that. And to escape from loneliness, they would also welcome that. So once I decided uh, that we should form a group, and that started with a poetry group. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we were about eight or nine. We used to sit together and they used to... Ah, we had uh, this satirist uh, writer, I cannot name him, and he started teaching us how to write short stories. And some of them were my role models. I had a friend who had an execution center, sentence over his head. And I was learning a lot from him. Uh, somehow we, we try to treat each other. Uh, there isn't any other choice. What did you learn from him? Resilience. Uh, resistance. Because every morning when he woke up, say at the middle of the night, he could be called for to be taken to the gallows. I mean, how can you live a life like that? I don't know. We had, we had a few who had uh, execution sentences. And you don't know what's going to happen to them now? No. Will you be able to keep in touch? Is it very difficult? Very difficult. Very difficult. That must be hard. Yes. I think the best thing for us is that we should concentrate, not on us, because we are now safe, we are here. We should concentrate on the people we have left behind, be it dual nationals or mononationals. And uh, a lot of effort is needed that things like this won't happen. Uh, many of them are innocent and their lives are being destroyed. Just finally, you, about Evan Prison, you wrote this, I have to stop feeling, stop the feeling of pure rage or self-pity. Break isn't a choice, only survival. I'm not the same person who stepped into the prison. So, I mean, this is a, maybe a hard question to answer, but how do you feel now? Do you feel joyous? Do you feel furious? Are you relieved? Are you all of those things? Are you it's, a mixture of, it's a mixture of all of that. Yeah. I cannot be joyful because I've got friends back there who are going through the same suffering. How can I celebrate? How can I be, be happy? It's momentary. For example, you see, uh, perhaps you see a clip that uh, my son bought uh, uh, fish and chips for me, for example, and it was so nice. <laughs> eating fish and chips 
after yeah. uh, nearly five years or having my first beer. These are little moments which are quite, quite nice. They are quite important. But when you think hol holistically on the, on the, on the, on the matter, you, you cannot be feel, feeling happy. But do you feel guilty? I mean, you can't feel guilty that you've been released. It wasn't your fault that you were imprisoned. You always tell yourself, is it that thing that I could do or the other thing that would make the change? Uh, so that uh, another person would be accompanying me in that aeroplane. Again, I, I stress on the fact that Morad is one of them. Mm. Uh, but there are many others, but I'm not at liberty to, to name them. Uh, they're there. Mm. And the feeling, the, the suffering is even more intensified when you are left behind. We have had people, we went to their send-offs mm. at the foot of the staircase. We used to clap for them, we used to cheer, and, and as they were leaving, we could feel the positive atmosphere that we have someone who is being released from this cage mm. and we would uh, congratulate each other as well and hoping and wishing that I hope you're, you will be the, the next one and the other one is, would say you would be the, the next one but in your heart you were somehow feeling that when is it going to be my turn so when I was walking up those, the, uh, uh, those uh, stairs, uh, waving at everybody to say goodbye, I could see that, um, yeah, you, you feel that you're betraying them. You feel that you don't deserve this. It is them, because they have been so good to you. But you do deserve it. Uh, everybody deserves it. And I'm not going to be quiet until I see all of them back home. And the mononationals who are there, to be, to be released, or to be retried at least, by a fair judge. Let's go on to you coming home and the deal that the government struck. Um, Nazanin, who you flew home with, um, said yesterday uh, that she should have been freed six years ago. It shouldn't have taken five foreign secretaries to secure her release. You were held captive for nearly five years under four different foreign secretaries. Did you feel forgotten? I agree with Nazanin 100%. She, in fact, put her finger on the right button uh, by saying that. She should have been here years ago. If that debt was paid, that wasn't a ransom, that was a debt that the British government owed should have been paid, and if it was paid, uh, perhaps none of, none of this would have happened. So, uh, yeah, I feel a bit angry. Sherry, Sherry tried to get um, an audience with the Prime Minister, with, with Boris Johnson, to talk about your case. Her letters were never answered. It took... Uh, even a punishment, because I, had, I received my second indictment, because partly because of the voice message I sent to Boris Johnson. So I risked my safety, but I managed to convey that message to him. Unfortunately, he did not spend even five minutes to give a telephone call to my family to say that you are there. I see you. Tell us about the voicemail. How, what, 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 to, to explain that to was during the time was. of the COVID thing that I was angry because uh, I, at the same time I, I was blaming uh, th those who, were, who captured us. Uh, I was blaming the British government. Why, do, why don't you do anything about it? Mm. Do we need a, death, a dead person in our, our hands so that you would start mm. shaking and moving? Mm. Uh, and doing something about it. And uh, I was really angry. And that's why I decided to send that voice message, hoping that uh, it would make a change. And this was in, what, 2019? Yes, yeah, I think 20... so, yeah. yeah. And um, 
and Sherry did not get a response at all. No. And subsequently... And it took, it took Richard a hunger strike. Yes. So you sent Boris Johnson a voice note in 2020 to try and get your case heard by the PM. Did Sherry hear back from him? No. Nope. Unfortunately. She made many attempts. And it was... All of them were unsuccessful. And since you've come home, the Prime Minister's written to you and Sharon would like to see well, last you. Last night we received a letter. Mm. Now he is eager to see us. How do you feel? Uh, how would you interpret that? Well, how do you feel about that? I think that uh, it's a bit of opportunism involved in it. At the same time as all of this hap has happened uh, under his command. So one could argue that it was the British government, the present British government, which succeeded in doing that, which is correct. At the same time, we could say that, why didn't you contact us, my family, and now you are eager to do that? How would you expect us to absorb that? How, how would you expect us to think about, uh, of you uh, with this letter now? Why couldn't this letter be sent uh, five months ago, a year ago, two years ago. Why now? And will you, will you see him or you not decide? I'm not sure. OK. Just to go back to you and Sherry, you studied in the UK before returning to Iran and you raised your children in Iran, but you came back to the UK 17 years ago and you spent so much of your life here. Do you think part of some of the difficulties with your case as well was because there was a feeling that because you didn't spend your entire life in the UK that you weren't properly British. Was that something that was underlying this? And that must aggrieve you if it was, surely. This is one of the criticisms that uh, I have to make, is that when uh, they were uh, going to... Uh, my lawyers were applying for uh, diplomatic protection. Mm, which Nazanin got, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, our Britishness came on the question. OK. How British are you? How British should I be? This is the place that we love to be. This is the place we return to. Mm. This is the place that we raised our kids, and now both of them have been educated. Uh, your university ed educated people who are actually serving in this country. Mm. How British can you, should you be? Uh, and yet, we were not recognised that, as that. At least practically, we were not. Which that must is... make you feel quite angry. Yes. And particularly for Sherry, because she was here trying to get you that, that formal diplomatic protection, that yes. diplomatic protection status. It, it elevates the case to become a formal state-to-state -state issue, so it can make a real difference, can't it? Yes, which we, we, we did not benefit from it. Could you go back to Iran? I dare not. <laughs> That's don't want to go through the, uh, through the same ordeal. That's a loss too, though, isn't it? Because your parents... Yes, my mum is there, and yeah. I'm worried about her. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry for that. That's... Um, extremely worried about her. There was a fundraiser to pay your fine for your release. What happened to that money, and how much did you raise, and what are you going to do with it? First of all, I have to... Uh, express my gratitude to the British public mm. who were so supportive. Uh, Sherry had to raise that money overnight. They took everybody, the family members, the credit cards, uh, whatever they had to actually to come with that sum. How uh, much did you have to pay? Nearly 20, uh, that was 33,000 euros. And the government which, didn't pay that money for no, you? No, okay. and. Uh, then uh, they started uh, doing this fundraising, and I'm really grateful. Now we have exceeded that uh, amount, and what we intend to do is to use part of it for the family to come uh, to get on its feet. Yes. And the rest, we are going to put it in good use. Uh, perhaps Amnesty International is going to be a, a good okay. candidate. That's great. For... Well, it must have been hard for show when you were keeping the house there, there are many deaths. Yeah, uh, sure. Elika uh, sacrificed a good portion of her business yeah. uh, campaigning for yeah, me. I, I can... Aryan 
behind the yeah. scene, but he was actually doing the same. OK, well, look, let's talk to... Let's talk about your last week and coming home. Now, you've told me about the um, champagne on the plane. I heard that you had a beer in the garden as well. Yes. Did you have a beer? <laughs> um, what was the first thing you chose to eat? It was English breakfast. Yeah, British <laughs> breakfast. Again, bacon. Bacon, good? I love very much. And, uh, and Sherry uh, has become uh, not a vegetarian, but she doesn't take... So she, she was sitting next to me, and I could see that she was taking all the bits of bacon in her plate and was transferring it <laughs> to my place. So extra portions for you. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, and what did you do? What did you all do at the weekend? Because you had your children with you and... Yes, yes. Uh, in the safe house that we were, we were looked after yeah. first class. Was that lovely? That was amazing, yes. And the dogs? Were the and dogs And the dogs, there? yeah. And, and Romeo recognised me. I'm going to ask you one more thing. It's your birthday next month. 8th of April. Yeah, how are you going to celebrate? I leave it to Sherry and, uh, and the kids. But, again, it is not going to be a full celebration. Unfortunately, until... The, ce the, the main celebration is when Murat Tahbaz mm. returns together with the rest of the dual nationals. Mm. Then we are going to raise our glasses of champagne all together. That will be, the, that will be my birthday, that will be my Nowruz. That will be the day that I imagine should happen. And I expect for it to happen any moment. OK. Anisha, thank you so much. Thanks for talking to me. It was an absolute pleasure. Same here. Thank you. Anisha Ashouri there. Well, in response to the interview, a government spokesperson said, from the Prime Minister down, this government has been committed to securing the release of Anisha Ashouri. It was always entirely in Iran's gift to do this, but UK ministers and diplomats were tireless in working to secure his freedom and are delighted he's now home. Stay with us, coming up next, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak. out of that little room. Mandatory evacuation, you must leave. I'm Greg Milam, Sky's US correspondent here in Los Angeles. It is almost impossible to predict where these fires will go next. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. This gives you an idea of the strength of those winds, strong enough to bend and twist metal. Are you trying to run me over, Sir Philip? No, go away. Look like it, sir. Will you respond to those who've made accusations, Sir Philip? Can you go away? I've seen the dark side of America. We are standing on the supply line right into the heart of America's opioid crisis. I've seen heartbreaking human stories. There was a river of blood coming out of the mosque. That's a scene that you don't forget. Christchurch has been changed forever by what happened here.
love my job because I get to do something that is contributing to a better future. Welcome back. Yesterday, the Chancellor Rishi Sunak gave his so-called spring statement, looking ahead to turbulent economic times. If he thought it would reassure people, he was mistaken. The revelations about the soaring cost of living and the plummeting drop in disposable income have been startling. It wasn't meant to be like this. The Chancellor's widely spoken of as a confident and charismatic politician, sometimes even as a prime minister in waiting. Now he finds himself presiding over problems affecting millions of people's jobs and families. Does he acknowledge the scale of the pain and can he really empathise with it? Uh, Rishi Sunak, thank you very much for being on the show and talking to me the day after your spring statement. Look, the big headline of it obviously was that living standards are going to fall to their lowest level in over six decades, let's just take that in, since the 1950s. But millions of people will have been watching your statement, they're reading the headlines, and they're very stressed and they're very anxious. Are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious on their behalf, and I know that it's the number one concern that people have right now. Families are struggling with the rising cost of lots of things. And that's why, in the spring statement, I wanted to make sure that we demonstrated we were on people's side and we announced a tax plan mm. that will deliver the biggest net cut taxes, net cut to personal taxes in... Two years quarter, time. Well, well, in quarter of a century taken together. Yeah. But I guess taking a step back, I've always tried to be honest with people. I can't, you know, I can't protect them from absolutely everything you, that we face, but where we can make a difference, we will. You, and I'm confident that the plan yesterday will, will do you, that. But you, you actually, during COVID, judged the public mood very well, and you did come in behind people. You're not really doing that now, really. I mean, what you've just talked to me about is in this unprecedented moment of inflation at a four decade high, uh, living standards fall into the lowest levels in this year since the 1950s. It is unprecedented and you haven't really been able to respond uh, in a way that perhaps people need. Is that because you just simply cannot do that? Or do you acknowledge that you might have misjudged the moment that people feel abandoned? Well, I, th I think that the, thing, the right thing to remember is the context, and they're very different situations. You know, what we were grappling with over the last couple of years was a pandemic where the government forcibly shut down the country and the economy. That's different to dealing with global inflationary forces, which we're not alone in facing. You know, the US is actually seeing higher inflation than we are right now, yeah. Europe similar. You... And the response to, to different economic situations is necessarily different. And, and actually, I think what we've done is substantial. If you take together you know, nine billion pounds to help people with energy bills announced last month, yeah, but, the significant tax yeah. cuts that we announced yesterday, they will all help. But of course, they can't mitigate all the difficulties that high inflation is, is causing. No, no chancellor could do that. It's like bringing a pea shooter to a gunfight, isn't it? I mean, the, the level of support is only scratching the surface of the actual reality of people's lives. You do acknowledge that. I, you can make an argument about you're limited in what you can do, but at least acknowledge that the pain people are going to feel is real and that as a government you cannot really offset it. Oh, gosh, I've been completely honest about that. And I've always said that you know, no government can fully offset the impact of inflation running at those levels. That's the same here as it is in, in any other country. You're absolutely right, and I haven't shied away from being honest with people about that. You know, we, it is impossible to fully protect people against some of these mm -hmm. things. And, of course, our actions to sanction Putin, as I said yesterday and as of others, they're not cost-free for us here at home. I'm going to bring you to two specifics which I wanted to ask you about. One was on energy bills. It seems to me that you are going to have to put in additional support in the coming months. Do you accept that that is likely? So we don't know what's going to happen in October. It's really too early to know what will happen then. And the energy prices are moving around so wildly that I don't want people to sit here right now and think, gosh, it's going up by this much or, or not going up. We, we don't know. Uh, the, the forecasts move around by you the held day. Some, you, held, you held money back. You held 
money that you could use back, it seemed to me, yesterday in order to give you a cushion to make more interventions. Is that fair? Well, I, I think in general I've always been responsive to the situation and it will continue to be responsive to the situation. Do you acknowledge about the absolute poverty figures and doesn't that bother you, the idea that under your leadership half a million children are going to go into absolute poverty? It's the biggest figure, according to the Resolution Foundation, outside a recession. Well, I, I mean, what we do know is a track record, because there's lots of projections and speculation about the future, but the track record shows that over the last uh, 10 years, since we've had Conservative governments in charge, the number of people living in poverty has actually declined by about 1.3 million people. That includes 300,000 children uh, from memory. So actually, that's a record that I'm proud of. Now, obviously, a lot of that happened before um, you know, I, was, uh, I, I was imposed. But the actions I've taken over the past couple of years have ensured that we have protected those on the lowest comes the most. I understand you can say about the problems of the economy and inflation are things out of your control about global inflation, but to kind of deny the fact that uh, think tanks that look at this stuff warn about inflationary pressure putting people into poverty uh, and, and sort of challenging that, I, I find it's like being a bit gaslighted, to be honest. No, but, I'm not, but I'm not denying for one second that inflation is difficult. Of course it's difficult, and it's most difficult for those on and, lower and incomes. And my point is you I could have given more support to low incomes, and you chose to target tax... And that's your decision as Chancellor, but just acknowledge that, so that you chose to target your tax cuts in a different way. I actually ch chose to target them specifically in a way that is beneficial for those on low and middle incomes. And actually, you quoted lots of think tanks. They also said that the best way to help those on low incomes through the tax system is to raise national insurance thresholds. It is the policy that delivers the most benefit. Well, Rishi Sunak there on the spring statement, but stay with us because we're going to have more from him coming up next. I'm going to talk to the Chancellor about juggling the pressures of running the economy and being a dad.
do want to ask you a little bit about you and your values and picking up on your values. Your, your parents emigrated here in the 1960s from East Africa, your father a GP, your mother a pharmacist, they opened a chemist, and then they sent you to one of the best public boarding schools in the country, to Winchester, and now you are the Chancellor. They were very ambitious for you, clearly. You know, I'm sitting here talking to you, the product of lots of people's sacrifice, hard work and kindness, and started my grandparents, actually, who emigrated together with my, my parents. And, and you're absolutely right about my parents. For them, education is everything. They thought that was the best way they could help provide a better life for, for me and my younger brother and sister. So for them, that was the focus of their hard work, uh, was to provide that opportunity for us. And that's ultimately what motivates me today. It's why I'm in politics. It's why I do this job. Mm -hmm. It's to try and spread uh, the, the say, you know, as much of the opportunities that I was really fortunate to enjoy to as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. And education, for me, is, is one of the best ways we can do that as a, as what, a country. What, I wonder what it must have been like for you going from, a, from the background you had into the upper middle classes of, of British society go into this public school, this one of the best in the country where you met so many people from the upper echelons of society. What was that comfortable or was it tough for you or was it something in between? <laughs> you know, I, I, it was an amazing opportunity, uh, is what it was. Did you feel and like you were out of place? No, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I was really lucky to have that opportunity. It was, it was something that was really extraordinary. It certainly put my life on a different trajectory. As I said, it's you know part of the reason I'm, I'm sitting here, and I'm, I'm really grateful to have had that opportunity. And you know, I look back on that time. It's helped make me who I am as a person, and I'm sure it helps me do the job in the way that I do it. I sort of asked because I just wondered, did you feel, did you feel out of place? Did it feel like a world you didn't belong in or did you just adapt? Well, I, prob I you know, probably just adapted because I'm, I'm sitting here talking to you. So. Yeah, you probably uh, did okay. But it's, you know, but I, I think, you know, I think we have an amazing country that is brilliant at integrating people from lots of different backgrounds uh, into society mm -hmm. and that's, that's a very special thing about our country. It's always been an open, tolerant welcoming country and I think if then, people are if people are prepared yeah. to work hard and integrate then yeah. they're always been warmly accepted did, and that's that's what I've always you, felt. But you did have talked about racism, suffering yes. racism yeah. and feeling very stung by that so it wasn't always an opening and there were points in your life oh, where... Oh gosh of course of course there were yes and of course I experienced that growing up and I think actually you know now that I when I think about what's happened to the country I think I said it at the same time I think some of the things that I experienced as a kid growing up probably just, you, know, you, you would much more uh, unlikely to see now and that's a sign of the so progress you, that we that we've made as a country. With your girls do you worry about it for them about them experience racism or you think the country no, has changed? No so I usually find if I don't actually right. you're probably right in a way that I bet my parents probably did worry about it a bit yeah. um, I not that I've talked to them explicitly about it. I, I don't worry about it for my girls, and that probably tells you a, a sign of the well, that's good. Said, that's a progress that's a good, that we've made. That's yeah, a good no, thing. I think, as I said, and we have always been... Uh, you know, there's always improvement. Of course there's always room for improvement. It'd be wrong to pretend that there isn't. Uh, but I, I generally feel really proud of the way that our country does this. I think, it does it, I think it does it better than most. And I've got two more things to ask you, uh, just on your, your background. Um, so you were very successful. You are very successful. You went to Oxford. Then you went into the city. You worked in finance in a hedge fund. You yourself became, you were a self-made millionaire. You became a millionaire. You then married a, a multi-millionaire, one of the wealthiest women in Britain, uh, whose father's a billionaire. You kind of, it struck me that you went from being sort of part of the upper middle classes of Britain to almost being part of a global elite. How did that affect your outlook on life? Well, I think actually the, the experience I've had of living and working abroad, and particularly uh, I spent, I studied in California and yeah. Silicon Valley. And you still and have a up, home there, don't you? Yeah, and I still, and, and I worked there for many years. And actually, my, my kids were born there. Um, you know, that's actually been really helpful because I think one thing that policymakers and people in my job need to do is, is to have a global outlook. You know, that we need to make sure that Britain can compete. How do you keep it real? Yeah, you're a really wealthy man. How do you keep it real? Do you take a bus? 
do you go to the supermarket? Of course I go to the supermarket and I, you know, whether it's, there's lots in North Allerton <laughs> where we live in, in North Yorkshire uh, and Teesside is on my, you know, by back door. So if I said so before, like if my kids are at the, we're at the cinema at the weekend, we're in Darlington, we're in Stockton, we're at the, you know, we're at the Clip and Climb there. Those are the kind of things that I'm doing on the rare chances yeah. I have some time off with my, uh, yeah. with my kids. And you can see that in the policies we've put in place because of my constituents, because of that perspective. Like, like all MPs, I'm not alone in that. So the wonderful thing about our system is that being good constituency MPs means that we are very responsive it, to what's going on on the ground. In a way that, by the way, most you, other finance ministers around the world it, don't, don't have that connection. Does it in a way that I'm even asking you this question, that because you're wealthy, somehow you might not be in touch? Do you find that, does that grate with you a bit? I, no, it's entirely expected uh, in, uh, in this job, so it's, no, it's a perfectly reasonable question okay. for people to ask. I, I Just one more thing. You've gone from head boy, you were head boy, weren't you? to hedge fund, to chancellor, you're pretty successful. Uh, you've always been at the top of your game, it seems to me, and it always looks quite effortless as well, although I'm sure it's not. <laughs> um, uh, what's the Definitely one <laughs> thing that you've got really badly wrong in your life? Oh gosh, I think we've only got about 10 seconds left, haven't we? So there's a long, long list of things. But no, I mean, look, the thing that is hardest for me is balancing, like everyone, is like juggling your a profession in your personal life. It's juggling your career and your family and it's trying to be, you know, I want to be the best possible person I can in this job because a lot of people are counting on me to do a really good job and I, that's a big responsibility. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of challenges and at the same time I'm still a dad and I'm still a husband and being in good in those roles is also really important to me and, you know, candidly it's a constant struggle. What's your biggest setback though? What's the, have you ever had a setback? I've, I've, had, I've, had, I've had plenty, everyone, everyone has had plenty. On a daily basis I'm confronted with the fact that I can't ever in this job do all the things that people would like me to do and I have to deal with that every single day. I have to every single day know that God I can't solve all the problems that people want me to no matter how many hours and I'm prepared to put in quite a lot and no matter how many I put in right, I can't solve all those problems. I can't you know, protect everybody against everything that is coming their way and of course I have to go to bed every night knowing that and during the crisis I was worried that we'd have millions and millions of people without a job and because of the Actions that we took that thankfully didn't happen, but you know, so things like that happen all the time. That's so what I'm grappling with day in, day out. Stressful yeah. job. Yeah. Once, when Boris Johnson was asked about his leadership ambitions, he said, If the ball came loose from the back of the scrum, <laughs> which it won't, of course, <laughs> it would be a great, great thing to have a crack at it. Is that your position too? Well, I, actually, the PM is more rugby fan. I'm much more cricket and uh, football fan. So, I, you know, I don't know what the appropriate analogy is. But look, as we've talked about, at the moment, there's a lot going on. There's a big job to do, and I'm fully focused on doing that job and trying to do it as well as I can. But if that cricket ball came at you, would you catch it? Uh, at this point, I'm just trying to, you know, stay at the crease and keep them uh, keep keep in place and not okay. get out. If the football <laughs> was at your foot, would you try and score <laughs> a goal? I don't think no, we're stretching these analogies too I know. far. No, God, I mean, again, I, I said, I, actually, I've managed to do more cricket nets than I've played football in the last year. So it's my one bit of relaxation now and then going do the odd cricket net. So. OK, wish you so much. Thank you very, very much. Very nice to see you. Thanks Thank for you. having me. Thank you. Well, that's all for tonight's show. Thank you so much for watching. And thank you, too, to our guests, Rishi Sunak and Ashuri Ashuri, Anushe Ashuri. Coming up next on Sky News, Western leaders meet at a NATO summit to discuss Ukraine.